Hello and welcome to the Arsenal way back again with you guys for another episode of the Press Box in which I'm joined uh, by Kai. Kai Nat, how are you doing mate? Are you well? I'm good, thank you. Uh, yeah, having a, having a very good week, very tiring week uh, as I'm sure you have too. So yeah, it's been it's been good. Yes, uh, you more so than me. Uh, well, let's you more so than me in you know exercise terms, which is better <laughs> for the body and soul. So we're going to go into <laughs> that and a lot more about Arsenal, of course, as well. But we'll, we'll kick off with that. Um, you spent some time at London Colney um, with with the guys over there, and you were put through your paces. Is that right? That is that is right. Um, I'm not sure there was much pace involved, but I was definitely put through it uh, on Monday. It was it was. <laughs> It was rough, yeah. Um, I got I managed to get down there thanks to Stat Sports, and again, thank you to them for having us. They had us at London Colony. They're a really cool piece of data, which uh, data sort of monitoring technology. You know, those uh, the vests that you see players wearing in training and matches, all that kind of stuff. And mm. they were uh, nice enough to have us down there. We spoke to their head of sports science, Barry Waters. I spoke to Kate McCain from uh, the Arsenal women's team, and uh, of course, we got an interview with her. That's going to be written up. That's going to be coming out this evening. So keep an eye out for that. And uh, of course, Per Mersac as well. That interview came out yesterday, and then got to take part in a training session afterwards, which uh, has been on the Arsenal Way YouTube channel. Has been, uh, yeah, I've been getting a lot of clips sent to me from my friends, just embarrassing pictures. I think uh, <laughs> I've been turned into a GIF of me just dying, saying I'm never going to do anything like that again. But uh, <laughs> makes you realise how far away you are from sort of the elite level of these top mm. pros. I did some sprints. I did some one-on-one -on -one drills. I did a, a match. Um, all sorts and yeah there's a reason why I'm, I'm an Arsenal journalist and not an Arsenal player I think that was that was made very clear on Monday afternoon it is surprising how quickly you realise like how unfit you can be in, in regards to I mean playing six aside I get knackered after five minutes so I yeah. can't imagine what it was like um, what was it the was... toughest part of it really so right at the end um, after we'd done everything we played a match uh, <laughs> they were like okay and now we want to see you run at top speed I was like what? <laughs> what do you think I've been doing for the past half an hour? <laughs> well, it's longer than half an hour. I think it was like an hour. Mm. And I, I just, just tell them, um, do not be sick on the London Colony pitches. Do not be sick. And thankfully, I managed to come through without embarrassing myself too much. You held it till you went outside, basically. Yeah, yeah exactly. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. Um, so I got home. Great. That's great. I mean, obviously, if you want to find out more and you want to watch Kai put through his paces, uh, you can by going on to the Arsenal way and, and looking for the video link uh, will be, of course, in the description. I'm sure uh, my kind producer may even throw it into the live chat for you while you're watching live as well. Um, let's let's talk about some Arsenal stuff, though, as well. And in particular, a lot of transfer stuff is coming up of late, which as we get closer to the January window, we do expect that to happen. But it still feels strange that the season only started two months ago. Uh, and we're now two months away from from kind of the the next window really over yeah. just over two months away, um, and there's been the, the most interesting part about for me anyway is the fact that it's a winger and that wing area that keeps getting linked. In particular, Noah Lang has been a player that's cropped up quite a bit uh, through kind of foreign media and, and notifying that area. And it's is it surprising to you that the wide areas are being so targeted with links at this point in time? Yeah, because I'd say if there's one. Position in the squad where Arsenal don't need to strengthen is probably out wide. Emil Smith Rowe, Bukayo Saka, Nicola Pepe, Gabriel Martinelli, youngsters like Kido Taylor Hart and Amari Hutchinson coming through as well. So I think I think Arsenal are pretty set in the wide positions, especially when you consider Pierre Emerick Aubameyang can play on either wing. And Flo Balligan's played there. Eddie and Ketty has played on the wing in the Carabao Cup. So I would be surprised if Arsenal went out and got a winger in January. I'm not saying it won't happen because stranger things have happened and Arsenal have made stranger signings in January than that, but. It's uh, it would it, yeah, it is surprising that that's the position Arsenal seem to consistently be linked with because there's other areas in the squad where I think they do need a bit more improvement. Do you think that the interest around kind of Noah Lang in particular and him being a club Bruges and 22, very much fitting the mould of the youth side of things that Edu is going for, it's a bit of a left field link as well. Do you think that? For kind of the fans that are, are trying to watch and tune in and obviously following all the transfer news, when you see kind of a left field link like that rather than to one of the big targets like your, your Raheem Sterlings that keep cropping up, etc., do you think that brings any more credibility to it because it's so kind of left field? I don't know. I don't want to. I don't want to dismiss anyone else's information because <laughs> I don't. I don't know. I haven't heard anything about Noah Lang in the yeah. conversations I've had with anyone. So um, I, I'd say probably not. <laughs> 
My thing with him, which makes me a little bit more suspicious about the link, is the links only seem to surface after he played in the Champions League against Neymar, against Mbappe, yeah. against uh, Messi when Club Bruce played PSG. So that just makes me a little bit sceptical just because if Arsenal had been tracking him, they wouldn't have just started tracking him off the bat of that one game, if that makes sense. I don't think at least. It's not impossible. I'm not saying it definitely won't have happened, but that's what just makes me be a little bit suspicious. And maybe I'll have to do a bit more digging around it. Um, but yeah, just in terms of age profile, it does make sense because we know that Arsenal are going for younger players or the sons and the summer 23 and under. And Eddie has said that that's the kind of, I guess, vibe he's going for in the transfer market. So mm. that side, it would make sense, but I don't think it makes sense on, on that many other fronts. But you know, you can never say never with Arsenal the transfer with it. Absolutely. Um, and what a lot of fans would have said never about is the possibility of Gabriel Martinelli leaving the club anytime soon. But his lack of minutes is is causing a bit of concern amongst fans. Obviously, he's an exciting young talent. He's only 20, but we want to see him play. And I mean, his debut season, he got into double figures for goals, which was a complete surprise. And of course, with that knee injury, fell off the way a little bit. And Arteta's put faith in, in other players like Pepe and Saka and Smith Rowe now in, in a wider area too. Arteta's confirms that he's not intending on sending him on loan in January and he's very much kind of looking to rely upon him. Do you think that his future is with those comments for the short term at least kind of assured but with how ambitious we know that Martinelli is is the door do you think ever open for him to maybe wanting to move on if he isn't going to get that game time um I, I don't think we've heard any inclinations or indications from the the Martinelli camp that that's the case I think yeah he's going to be sticking around I think that was always going to be the case just when you consider Aubameyang and Pepe will be away in January for the uh, AFCON we don't know how long they'll be away for or even if they actually will be going we assume they'll be going because they're both key players for their nations but yeah so when those two leave he'll get his chances Martinelli um, whether he'll be a bit rusty by that point that's the, the worry I have just given the lack mm. of minutes he's played he's injured again at the minute uh, Mikel Arteta told us that on Thursday in his press conference so uh, we don't know if he's going to be available on Monday but yeah I, I would say it seems highly unlikely. I know he's ambitious and um, he's a player who really wants to impress every time he gets on the pitch, but he signed a long-term contract with Arsenal. Um, so he's going to be here for a while. Unless someone comes in and pays, <coughs> pardon me, big money for him, he's not going to leave. Arsenal aren't going to be stupid enough to let him leave for anything less than a very high price. So unless mm. someone's come, willing to come in and pay that, then um, that's not going to happen, I don't think. He, I, I can't see him going alone. You have to think with Martinelli, Arteta did say this, he's only 20. We know he did so well when he was 18, but he's only young. He did have a big injury layoff. But also, Aubameyang may... <laughs> Lacazette is set to leave in the summer, and Ketty is set mm. to leave in the summer. Aubameyang will have one year left for this deal by that time. So his chance will come at Arsenal. I think he's just got to try and keep himself as fit and as ready as possible, which obviously he's struggling with a little bit at the minute. But hopefully he'll be able to take his chances when they do come along. Because unfortunately, with no Europa League... They are going to be few and far between the seats. Mm. You mentioned Lacazette there being set to leave in the summer with his contract expiring, of course. But his profile or his case in, in regards to kind of a transfer in January is it's almost impossible to tell because Arsenal are in a real predicament with the striking situation because the African Cup of Nations going on during that period, Aubameyang not being here. But with a player with just six months left at that point, and if a bid was to say come in for a player that you're not going to get anything for at the end of the season... If, that, if you're Arsenal, how would you balance that decision? And do you think that if that was the case, it, it would just naturally push Arsenal to move maybe for a striker if they're choosing slightly earlier than they intended? That's a good question. I think Arsenal would probably just take the hit if um, on Lacazette. I think that's the decision that's been made. I don't think, unless stupid money comes in for Lacazette in mm. January, again, you know, I'm caveating all my answers here with you can never say never, but it's the truth. You can mm. never say never with um, transfer window. But um, Lacazette, I'd say, is he's almost definitely going to be staying because of the African Cup of Nations, as you mentioned there, because of the fact that he's an experienced player within the dressing room, because of the fact that Mikel Arteta has been very clear that he doesn't want him to leave in general. He wants to keep him around because of how well he's training. And Arteta has always been someone who's been very keen to reward players who train well, who reward players who have the right attitude. And when we hear from Arteta on Lacazette, it's not a question of is he going to leave? It's a question of how can we get him the right number of minutes? So that's always mm. something to keep an eye on. And that, that will come. He'll get his minutes like as that just because A, Aubameyang can't play every single game and B, I think, um, yeah, when he leaves in January for the AFCON, um, he's going to get chances. For that reason, I'd keep him at Arsenal. I think it would be a risk, an unnecessary risk. 
to then throw Gabriel Martinelli in and expect him to play up front every single game or throw Flo Balogun in and expect him to start up, up front every single game when we don't know if either is ready. And also once Aubameyang comes back, both those young players will probably be relegated to second choice, by which point you're like, ah, could we set them on loan? Could they have gone and got some better game time elsewhere? So I'd say that I think if money comes in, um, Arsenal probably, yeah, like I said, just going to take the hit because uh, foreign clubs can sign a pre-contract agreement with him from January the 1st onwards. So I don't see why they're going to offer money that Arsenal would deem acceptable in January. And I don't know of any English clubs who are linked to Alex Lacazette as things stand. So unless something changes on that front, I think we'll probably see Alex Lacazette continue at Arsenal. So the end of the contract in the summer. We will be answering some of your questions uh, or attempting to at least in the chat box as well with the best information that we have. So if you have got any that you'd like to throw into the chat box, don't be shy. Please do throw them in. But before we go on to those, Kaya, some really interesting news broke yesterday on more of a social front, an exciting front, a film front uh, with, with Arsene Wenger's documentary uh, coming out in the start of November, November 11th, I think it is, and then for downloading DVDs on the 22nd or 24th, I think maybe of November. So it's it's interesting because I, I'm, I read his book, um, and what well, I say I read, I actually had him read it to me through the form of an audio book, so that, that was great, <laughs> just listening to Arsene Wenger read. But whilst I was enjoying him reading it, I didn't necessarily enjoy as much the content because... I didn't really learn anything that I, I already knew. I did, it didn't reveal to me any kind of hidden secrets, anything about his relationship with Mourinho, about the whole Wenger out protest that went on during the latter years of his time at the club. And the trailer that was released for the, for the kind of the film did focus in on saying, first of all, the words came up in his own words for the first time, which was strange considering it was a year and a day after his book came out for his autobiography, which of course you'd expect to be also in his own words. I assume they may be meant in video format. But then hearing obviously about the, the Wenger out protest and that being quite a heavy feature as part of the trailer. Are you what are you kind of anticipating for us to kind of have a look at based upon just just what you've seen from the trailer? Um yeah I'm really interested to see what he thinks about those Wenger out protests. I think Wenger's always been a classy guy and he'll always conduct himself in a classy manner, I think. I think that's just the way he is as a person. But it's, it's interesting to see whether that actually got under his skin. He's always such a calm guy. He's been so zen. You, you never really see him lose his cool. So it'll be fascinating to see whether that got under his skin, whether it impacted any of his thinking, whether it forced him to act in transfer market when maybe he thought he wasn't going to before, things like that. Um, I think what we'll see is he'll he'll at least claim, and I think the truth is that it didn't really have too much of an impact on him. I think he's, from what I can understand of it, he maybe seems a bit annoyed with the fact that he wasn't given till the end of his contract. That always mm. it's always come across to me whenever he's spoken about it. He wanted his he wanted to be able to see it through to the end. Which I I, I think Arsenal maybe made a mistake giving him that to, that final two year extension when they mm. finished outside the Champions League, just because. It was clear by that point the other teams were getting further ahead and it was getting a bit messy. And I think towards the end, a lot of the scenes, the Wenger out scenes, I think, yeah, when we look back on them, I don't think it's a, it was a good look for us at the time. I think relatively, a lot of it became quite disrespectful towards the end, which wasn't nice to see. And when you think about what he's done for the club and how difficult it's proved to be to get the club back into the top four since then, I think we've come to value what Wenger did for all that time with a lot more, I guess, um, appreciation. But he's always spoken about how um, he doesn't need to die because he's already seen what it will be like for his funeral because everyone's talking about him in the past tense. So mm. it'd be interesting to see what he thinks about that kind of thing. And yeah, in interviews, he, I remember he did the Desert Island Discs as well, which is a, for those of you who do, you might not know, it's a show in the UK where um, I guess it's a radio show where people look back on their lives through picking music and songs and stuff. And he, he didn't really address anything in there in terms of the end at Arsenal. It was more just a success. So yeah, I'm interested to see what he thinks. And uh, he doesn't seem to be giving Mourinho that much space in his head. It doesn't seem like Wenger mm. really cares that much about Mourinho. I think Wenger maybe lives kind of rent free in Mourinho's head from what he seems to say from yeah. it. But it doesn't seem like Wenger actually cares. I think he's kind of moved on because the height of their rivalry was what, eight, nine years ago now? Yeah. It's been a while. Um, yeah, I think I think it'll be interesting to see. Like I've said it a hundred times now, it'd be good to see what what he thinks about those those final days because, like you said, and like like I think most Arsenal fans watching, uh, he's never addressed them. We want to hear what he genuinely thinks about it, and 
the guys who made that documentary, that, that Finding Jack Charlton documentary they did before was fantastic. Mm-hmm. If you haven't seen it, I, I, I urge you to go out and watch it. It's a really good documentary. So they know what they're doing. Um, I think, yeah, like you, I was a bit disappointed by that autobiography just because it felt like it left a little bit to be desired and left me wanting more. So, mm-hmm. yeah, hopefully this, this film um, it, it sort of addresses all those points where we don't quite feel um, we had our appetites filled. Yeah, I, I think that Arsenal fans this season have been a bit spoiled because we're getting this. The Amazon documentary as well be out at the end of the season. Yeah. It's a lot of, you know, access all areas kind of situation going on with Arsenal this season. When you think of it as such a closed club, but so often and things that go on behind the scenes very rarely um, kind of get out. It's it is great, and not, I mean you you got a triple threat because you got Kaya going to the the training <laughs> ground and going through his paces. So if anything, you've got you know arguably the the precursor to to what's to come on the Arsenal exactly. Way as well, so make sure you exactly. go and watch that. Um, let's jump into the chat box then and see what you guys are asking. We'll try and go through as many of these as we can before we have to wrap up. Uh, Adam Miller says, Kaya, hey guys, uh, do you feel if we move Emil Smith Rowe to the middle, uh, we could be light on the wings, possibly returning? him to that more natural number 10 position it's a good question um i think yes potentially because i like him as on the wing and i don't think kaya sack has been at his best when he's played left wing i don't think nicola pepe is at his best when he plays left wing although he can do it for me uh, i think emil smith his best position is out there on the left and i think moving him back into the middle when he does so in this sort of 4-3-3 setup arteta tends to play him on the right hand side which i don't really like him there I prefer him on the left where he can sort of get involved in the half spaces a bit more and dictate the play there he's someone who likes to i guess rather than passing the ball forward like an Erdegaard in a more traditional sort of central number 10 he's someone who gets the ball up the field by dribbling so for me best place to do that is on the wing because it's too contested in the middle of the park so just from a simplistic point of view that makes sense um but i get why arsenal would want to put him back into the midfield just because they haven't got that many creative players aside from him and Erdegaard who can play mm. in the middle of the park. Sandy's got it in him to get forward, make the Nars can play a good pass, but I don't think either of them are really attacking threats in the type you'd want from a number eight in a 4 3 3. So, yeah, that'd be something we have to see personally. I, I, I don't know what you think about Tom, but personally, I, I like seeing him as the on the left instead. Yeah, I, I really like seeing him on the left. I think it's, I, again, it's, I don't look at him as an out and out winger, he's kind of a wide playmaker style, yeah. but. If you saw that, I'm sure we all did see the goal that he scored for England's under 21s. He's got pace, like he's not yeah. slow by any means. And he's quick on the ball, quick off the ball. He can take players on. He, he loves kind of going to the byline and then cutting back in and, and trying to play that. He, almost in a bit like Grealish does sometimes where he runs to the byline and cuts back. I'm not saying he's at that kind of level. Yet, maybe one well, day. Yeah. Of course, yeah. Um, but it, it's something that I would like to see us persist and see him develop with more, especially now that we've signed Erdogan as, as a 22-year-old natural number 10, that you think they're going to develop in those positions. So you think that's probably going to be where he goes. Although saying that, we do seem to see a lot of links for wide players for Arsenal at the moment. So who knows what the future uh, will hold. Uh, Jonathan says, suppose in January Arsenal are willing to loan out Gabby, but receive offers only from Championship and Bundesliga league of clubs where would you rather we send him obviously with the caveat doesn't look like he is going to be going out on loan but say if he was where do you feel might be best suited i think bundesliga 100 percent. i think it'd be good to see him against top tier opposition no disrespect to the championship because the most of the throw went out on loan there and came back a much better player so it can work but for me gabriel martinelli is a player who needs to be playing in one of europe's top five leagues because he's that good so I think it would be something of a waste to send him out alone to the championship at uh, this stage in his career when he's proved he's, he's good enough to play in the Premier League. He's probably good enough to play in any league in world football because he's that good a player at such a young age. He's only going to get better with more game time. So yeah, Bundesliga for me. Absolutely, I agree. Uh, a. a Ron says, is playing 4-3-3 this season a realistic option except for the odd game, given that we only have Erdogan and smith Rowe as possible eights without having backups to them? Also, Mill smith Rowe seems to thrive on the left wing. I know we touched on that, but do you think the 4-3-3 is something that we, we may see more of? He tried it against Burnley and we won that game, but then very quickly reverted back to the 4-2-3-1. Do you think he's, he's set in his ways with that or do you think he has long-term plans for that formation? Um, I wouldn't say that Erdogan and smith Rowe are the only eight. I think Sambi can play there. I think Maitland Niles can play there as well. They're sort of more box to box players, I guess, mm. than, than traditional creative number eights. So there's different types of number eights. And I think it depends on what kind of opposition Arsenal are playing. I wouldn't say the 4 3 3 is impossible if one of Erdegaard or Smith Rowe isn't playing in the middle of the park. So, yeah, I, 
I, I think um, it's possible, and I think we may even see it against Crystal Palace because I think Mikel Arteta will want to try and get as many attacking players onto the pitch at home against a team Arsenal expected to beat. So, yeah, it should be should be good to see that, and I think it's definitely possible with the likes of Sambi. Sambi himself said that he sees himself as an eight, so yeah, no reason why he can't play that. Yeah, very true. I mean, Bentner did say he was the best player in the world, but, you know, it's just, <laughs> it is what it is. <laughs> Kyle says, good day, gents. Kyle here from Cape Town in South Africa. What are you guys' opinions on playing Pepe up front? I feel like the combination of play between a front three of Emil Smith, Rowe, Pepe and Saka could work. Good question. Um... Oh, I have to think about that. He's played Lone up striker, front a bit for Neil. Yeah, he has. But for me, when it, Pepe is a striker, and this does come up a lot, and I, I see this on, on other mediums where we get asked this question. For me, I would like the idea of Pepe centrally. I just don't think it works as a sole striker. I think that he could work playing off of someone and he's, we know he's a good finisher. He's arguably one of the best finishers in the team. Like You, you get him in front of goal and he's very clinical. It's just he often doesn't get near enough to the goal because he's so far pushed out wide on the right and his only real move is to cut inside on his left foot most nine times out of ten. Yeah. So he's quite predictable to defend against. So if you move him more inside, it allows him to be more unpredictable. But I don't think we're going to play a formation that's going to allow that to happen. Now, what I would say is what Mikel Arteta wants from his number nine is someone who can link the play and someone who can be quite good at yeah. passing and combining with other players. I don't really think that's Pepe's style. I think, like you say, he's more of a finisher than um, someone who is involved in the build-up play. So I, I can't see it working in Mikel Arteta's arsenal, but he could definitely be a, a, a centre-forward for another team. for sure. This is a bit of a funny question from Matt G. He says, would you rather Harry Kane's career or Jamie Vardy's career? <laughs> ooh, ooh. Uh, unless, unless saying, would you say. rather win something or not win something? Yeah, <laughs> yeah. It's, a, it's a tough choice. Um, and then be stuck at Tottenham for the rest of your career as well. I definitely... Mm. Definitely. Well, it's probably Jamie Vardy's career. I think. I think he's had a pretty, pretty rags to riches story. I think it's pretty inspirational. And um, yeah, let's let's go Jamie Vardy because I, I like trophies, and you're not going to get any of them at Tottenham. Absolutely. Cass says, "What do you think about signing Adrian Rabiot on loan, left-footed player? Maybe needed in the midfield to give balance if Xhaka is not available come January, while Partey is away at the African Cup of Nations." If Arsenal could get him on loan, fantastic. Yeah, go for it. I think that'd be a fantastic. <laughs> deal um i don't know if juventus would be willing to send him out on loan i've not really kept much of an eye on how he's been faring for them this season if he's been playing a lot I th yeah he's a sublime player who can do the, the role that jacka does arguably a lot better so i think someone like adrian rabio would obviously be a, a fantastic introduction to that arsenal side uh what i would say though is um he does have he's had some like attitude problems i think in his career and maybe yeah. arteta is not a huge fan of those types of players we've seen it with um uh, Gwen Doozy's coming to mind just because of the hair and the French international. <laughs> Wasn't but, it his um, mum, though, that was the issue? Yeah, with her? I always I remember think, it. Yeah, maybe. I, remember his I think he involved. sacked her. I think she was his agent. He and I, think he sacked, I think he sacked his own mum as, his, as yeah. his agent. And I think since then, actually, the last few years, he hasn't. I haven't heard anything of like that. Fair enough. So, so I think he's changed as well. What's interesting about Rabio is that, like, at Juve, when he's fit, he plays. Um, yeah. So he's played five games so far this season. He missed two games, both of them were because of injury, but he started all the other games that he played in for the looks of things. Um, he started the games, both games in the Champions League. So he is very much intertwined with Juventus at the moment. And it doesn't look like they would be interested in, in moving. And what, just based on that question, because I, I often see questions like this about throwing up a name of a player. Someone like Rabio is at Juventus. We're seeing these this sterling stuff going on at the moment, a player at Manchester City. And, and something I notice, and obviously coming from the fan perspective on the Arsenal way, do you feel that sometimes Arsenal fans, just not all of them, but just kind of some of them, dis, kind of disregard some players quite quickly? Like they see the name Sterling and they go, I don't think, nah, I'm not having Sterling or I'm not having Rabio. When actually, when you think about the context of where Arsenal are right now and, and maybe kind of the quality levels that they need, that maybe we should be more open as fans to, to different types of signings. Yeah, 100%. I think Arsenal. Uh, Arsenal need to get back into Europe and players like Raheem Sterling and Adrian Rabio would be able to close that gap instantly. They're mm. top level players and there's a reason they played for teams who have been winning league titles, uh, cup competitions, getting to Champions League finals. There's a reason they're, they're key members of those squads. So Raheem Sterling and Adrian Rabio are two fantastic players. Whether Arsenal will be able to get them is, a, is a, another question. But I think Arsenal, they're not really going for those types of big names at the minute. That's mm. not really the 
the, the type of player they're going for. We saw this in the summer. They're going for maybe slightly lesser known names who can can build and grow within the current squad. They're not trying to build a team to challenge for the title now. They're trying to build a team to challenge for the title in two, three years, which is what I think someone like Sterling or Rabio, even if they were to come into Arsenal, they, they, they'd want titles and they want to be challenging for things pretty instantly, as well as game time, which I'm sure they would get. But I think, yeah, I think there's, there's that to consider when it comes to those mm. big names being linked to Arsenal. It's, it's not impossible. And I think Arsenal have signed a few big names in the past, but it's not really, doesn't, it doesn't really seem like that's what Edu's in the market for right now. I think Arsenal are looking for good value as much as Edu. Lastly, we obviously we sat down a couple of weeks ago in our last conversation and we've talked about the transfer window previously and the very much I, I, the feeling was between us when we spoke was that Arsenal were very much looking at the January window as, as more outs if, if that happens and players like say Kalasanach will probably be moved on. It's an opportunity to maybe see if you can get something for the likes of Eddie and Ketir, etc. Um, has your mind changed at all in the last couple of weeks as to whether you think Arsenal may look to do anything regarding income it's just just in the way we've seen links grow and players get injured and stuff like that do you think anything has changed um i, I guess was was Jacker injured when we last spoke i can't remember um i, I think I, he i think he was but i don't think that the length of time that he okay. was out was okay. confirmed so yeah. i'd say i'd say that might might sort of push arsenal towards maybe thinking more going in for a central midfielder so i guess that's changed on that front but mm. um I think we'll see who's in our in January, just because that's a that's a must of any transfer window with Arsenal. Oh, yeah. That's just standard, <laughs> so that's going to happen. But um, would you take him? Uh, it depends on what kind of deal. If it's a short term loan, maybe, but I don't think as a long term investment. He's necessarily what Arsenal need right now. Um, I'll make, I'm I'll sure let, there's lots I'll of people. Let Bailey know that you're on my side with the. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm sure there's lots of people who would disagree. I remember when it was the hour versus. Partey debate last summer was mm. it last summer or a couple of summers? Uh, two now? summers, I think twenty twenty it was. Yeah, yeah, blimey. So it was always, it was, I was always team team Thomas on that front. So mm. yeah, I think it's just um, I can't see Arsenal getting that many players in this summer unless there's more injuries that come up or unless players have to stay at the Afcon for a while. Uh, it's difficult. I think Arsenal have quite a big squad for the number of competitions they're in. So like we said, I, mm. unfortunately, as things stand, sorry to. I guess, quash people's hopes. It does seem like it's just going to be outgoing. But as I've caveated every single answer <laughs> on this show so far, you can never all let me out. And I think yeah, I'm going to have to get a T-shirt with that on for the next time I come on the show. Well, thank you for listening to the Arsenal Caveat Show today. <laughs> uh, appreciate you all turning uh, up for the show. Of course, if you could drop a like on the Arsenal way, we would really appreciate it. And subscribe to the channel if you are new around here as well. Sorry that we didn't get to go through all of your questions. We have just run out of time. Um, but do tune in every single week. I'll be joined by Kaya and some guests to be going through all of the week's events in our press box show and get all the latest from the press conferences, of which Kaya, of course, will be attending. And you can watch them as well on the channel. As I've mentioned a couple of times, please do go watch Kaya video on the Arsenal way from his time at London Colney. Uh, it's entertaining, it's insightful, uh, and it's definitely worth a watch. Kaya, thank you ever so much as always for your time. Would you want to give yourself a shout out and tell people where to find you? Yeah, thank you again for having me on. I'm on Twitter at Kaya Kaya97, as you can see conveniently going along the bottom there. I'm also on Facebook yeah. and um, I'm now on the Arsenal Way YouTube channel with that video. So yeah, give it, give it a there watch. There you go. Lovely stuff. Thank you ever so much, guys, for tuning in. You can obviously follow the Arsenal Way as well on Twitter at the Arsenal Way N5. Make sure you're following us on Facebook as well and subscribe on YouTube as well. It's been an absolute pleasure as always. And as always, keep following us down the Arsenal Way.